Well, praise the Lord. Um, I talked to um, Brother Noel Marino a little while ago on the phone. I mentioned him this morning. And uh, he said just a couple of days and his son is going to be deployed. Um, he says I, he does not know where. He assumes somewhere in the Middle East. So, um, Noel, I know you're watching. Uh, we appreciate your son willing to serve his country. Can I hear God's people say amen? Amen. Um, I still, I look for these guys every time Lisa and I go somewhere. They're usually at Sam's and Costco. Okay? And uh, they're always wearing their hat, Vietnam. or uh, I met a guy, uh, not, no kidding, and he was walking around with a walker, but he was, he was walking pretty fast. He was, he was in good shape. And his hat said World War II. Not very many of those guys left. Okay, uh, my uncle down in Arkansas, he's in his 90s, and he was, uh, he, uh, was on those Japanese islands. And um, so anyway, my, my heart and my respect goes out to those World War II vets. And uh, there's just not very many of them left. So uh, anyway, I told him I appreciate it, and he thanked me for it. They, all, they always do. They always are very thankful that someone... Um, Someone thanked them, someone shook their hand, showed them their appreciation, and I think it's the right thing to do. Amen? I really do. We were uh, headed down to um, a couple of years, well, last year, I think, we were headed down to Florida, took Michaela down there, and um, there was a lady deputy in a gas station, and uh, I was filling my soda cup up. I said, ma'am, I just want you to know I appreciate what you do, and God bless you for it. And she went, Thank you for that. It's like she had not heard that from anybody. And um, our first responders, our policemen, our ambulance guys, our firemen, uh, these are the guys that are going to go in the burning building to save people. These are the guys that are going up and down the streets watching for, uh, apparently there's two guys, and we think we know both of them, that are breaking into anything they can find. They've been caught on neighborhood security cameras, trying to open car doors. Um, Dee Poli got broke into, took her mom's wedding rings, took her wedding rings, and um, we think it's the same person. So I sent a picture of the person I think it is, sent it to Dee, and she's going to show it to her neighbors because her neighbors saw who it was. And so anyway... Um, Pray for them and lift them up. Anyway, I was talking about Noel Marino. Pray for Noel. Uh, he does have prostate cancer, and uh, he's, he, it's getting the better of him. And I told him, I said, I'm worried about you, Noel, and uh, we're going to be praying for you. And he says he goes back to the doctor December 26th. So just uh, lift him up uh, before the Lord and just pray for him. I know he would appreciate it. All right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ready to pray? Amen. This is God's house. It's a house of prayer for all people. Heavenly Father, come before you tonight. We thank you, God, for this amazing book that we have. We thank you, Lord, that herein is written our life, our liberty, uh, the blessings that you have given us, the curses that you have warned us about. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the depth of wisdom and knowledge that is contained in this book. Father, I thank you for not removing this book far from me years ago. But Father, just making it a part of my life, a part of my own personal walk with you, and part of, Lord, what you're doing in this church. So, Father, we ask, God, that you bless your word tonight. Give us a greater understanding of things from your word. And, Lord, let it be a blessing to those here. Let it be a blessing to those that are watching online. We'll be watching later on as this uh, gets over the Internet. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would guide people uh, and help us, Lord, in our times of temptation. Lord, help us to call out to you, to cry out unto you, to ask you for your help. And Father, we, again, we just thank you, Lord, for this book. We fellowship around it. We are communing with you in it and through it. We ask God, Lord, that you would just give us light tonight. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, let's take our Bibles and go back to... Oh, let's see here. Let's start in 1 John. Uh, these are some of the things that 
Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about this morning concerning temptation. Um, I don't want to just leave certain ideas hanging out there uh, without some biblical clarification on, uh, number one, where temptation comes from, what is the source of how we're tempted. Uh, of course, we know who the tempter is. That tempter is the devil. The devil doesn't act alone. He has devils that act with him. The devil is not omnipresent, which means the devil cannot be every place all at once. Now, he can inflict a large area, but he does not have his presence everywhere. So there are devils that are just as evil as he is, and God has... Uh, God uses these devils, these, the Bible calls them evil angels, devils, little g, gods. Uh, some refer to them as fallen angels. I think that's allowed because they're going to fall and they're falling now. Um, but they will deceive, they will draw us to what is going to tempt us. Okay? They will draw us to what they are going to use to tempt us, to try to get us to sin, to try to get us into disobedience with God, um, since we're saved, does it really matter whether we sin or not? Does it matter? Yes. Brother Lonnie informed me, he said, Pastor, I want you to look into it, and I know if I were to give some names of some people that are involved in it, it would shock you. But there is a movement out there now we think it stems from Calvinism. Calvinism says, you're saved no matter what. Do anything you want. Um, but it's, it's called bold faith or um, it's called new grace or something. It's different names. But it basically says, if I want to have a Bud Light, I'll have a Bud Light. If I happen to get drunk, then I happen to get drunk. It's all covered under grace. So I can do it. It even suggests that if you're, guys, if you're lusting after a woman, it's, you're better off to commit adultery with her and just get it over with than to, I, I don't know what they're, I'm just going, I'm shaking my head, I'm going, I can't, I can't, Brother Lonnie, are you sure? Yeah, he's sure. Anyway, it's this idea that basically you can just do what you want and why not? You're a Christian. You're saved. You're going to go to heaven no matter what. So if this temptation comes along, just go for it and get it over with and, and move on. Okay? And it has affected some ministers that I know. And it, very, it troubles me very much. And so we're going to examine that in the light of the Scriptures. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here we go, the lust of the flesh, this is our list, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. And so, concerning what I just said to you, if I were to take Scripture and apply it to this doctrine, this doctrine fails. This doctrine says that you can be saved and still love the world, and that's not how it works. The longer that I'm saved, the more that God does in me and shows me His goodness, the more I hate this world, I hate what Paul said, the sin that does so easily beset us, I hate it, I hate the things of this world. I hate how this world is turning out. I would just, if God were to give me a choice, I would say, God, I would prefer not to have my children and grandchildren in this evil world. Now, I'm not going to put a sack over their head anytime soon, okay? But I'm just saying, if, if God gave me an out, I'm taking it, okay? If God blows the trumpet and says, let's all go home, I'm ready. I'm going home, amen? Because I do not like this world. I do not like... The people that are in this world and their practices of evil, and it's not just the weirdos out in Portland, okay? It's Jefferson County weirdos. It's Jefferson County drunks. It's Jefferson County adulterers. It's Jefferson County dope heads. These are the, this is why I hate this world and the things that are going on in this world, and it's not getting better. 
This is why people need to be saved. Amen? <clears throat> but to, as a Christian, to attach myself to things of this world that I'm supposed to hate, knowing that if I attach myself to them, they will lead me into sin. My conscience, I can't do that. Can't do it. You know, it's, it's like if, if anybody in this church has a, has a problem with alcohol, you haven't drank in years, you don't like it, you don't want to be around it, you know that you shouldn't be around it, then it's real simple. Don't go around it. Don't start running with people on Friday nights that are going out drinking, thinking, ah, that I'll, I sit there and, and drink soda and eat crackers, you know, while they drink. That won't last very long. Because the devil's going to use those friends and they're going to put it on you to have a drink with them. And it's not going to stop until you just absolutely kick the table over and say, look, I'm not drinking! Okay? Then they won't want you around anymore. But to just deliberately attach your things, yourself to things of this world, that's going to get you in trouble. It's going to get you in trouble every single time. Don't love this world. Amen? Now, turn to uh, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Boy, this is a beautiful passage here. Jesus was not only tempted of, the sa of Satan in the wilderness three times. But I, I didn't know this until I was studying this out. Three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was also under temptation. What was the temptation that he was dealing with while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? His disciples fell asleep. That's the story. But what was the temptation that Jesus was under? What was it that he was considering? Matthew 26, 36. Look at this. I, di I didn't know this. Three times he said this. Then cometh Jesus, Matthew 26, 36, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now, did Jesus know that those guys were not going to last very long? He did. Now watch this. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. How many people's with him? Three. And he's the fourth. He's the fourth. Okay? I like this already. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That's his temptation. Then he says, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Was this temptation real or was he just reciting things to make it look spiritual? It was real. Watch this. So in verse 40, And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Verse 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not where? Underline that in your Bible. Watch. And pray. We know that Jesus used the word of God when he was being tempted of the devil. Okay? So that's, that's one tool that you have to your advantage in times of temptation. Temptation does not always come in the form of a woman in a red dress. You get what I'm saying? That's not the only kind of temptation that there is. There is a temptation where, and the word temptation means trial, a testing. There is times of temptation whereby you are, you are struggling even to come to church, to pray, to read your Bible. Those are times of temptation in and of themselves. When the devil is just really working at you, trying to get you... Don't believe, the Bible, don't believe the Bible anymore. Darwin said it's all a lie. And besides that, we've got evidence. And this, this. You don't have to believe the Bible. You don't, you don't really need to pray anymore. You don't need to do these things. You know what that is? That's the devil saying, hand over your weapons. Hand over your shield. 
so that I can come at you full force. I've got fiery darts here, and if your shield is in the way, obviously I cannot hit you with the darts, so hand over your shield. That's the devil tempting you to just give it up. Don't read. Don't pray anymore. Don't go to church and don't listen online. Okay? Go back to listening to Willie Nelson and go back to listening to ZZ Top and go back to listening to ACDC and go back to listening to uh, Tupac or whatever it is. But don't worry about your Bible anymore. Let me tell you something. The singers of this world have a message for the people of this world that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that? Whether you want to get into this argument about whether the music itself is wrong, the message and the lyrics of most popular music is contrary to Christian lifestyle and the Word of God. No way around it. Okay? doesn't matter if it's pop, rap, country, rockabilly, doesn't matter what it is. It's going to be contrary to the Word of God. So, here he is being tempted. In verse 41, he says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he's telling that to Peter, because he goes and prays, he comes back, Peter and them guys sound asleep. Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Now, think about this. Peter, upon hearing this, did what? Went back to sleep. What happened to Peter after this event? Three times. Three times he was offered the chance to admit to the world that he was a Bible-believing Christian. And three times he failed. You catching that? Now look back in your Bible. Verse 42. He went away again the second time, prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. That's the second time. Look what happens in verse 43. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Verse 44. And he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same word. And what happened the third time? He took the cup. Three times Peter is tempted, and three times Peter failed. Once again, three times our Lord was tempted by wanting this cup to pass from him so that he didn't have to go and be uh, whipped, tortured, mutilated, spit on, and then hang on a cross for six hours. Three times he thought about not doing it. And all three times he submitted to the will of God. Again, if I see anything in this Bible about temptation, it's, we'll fail at it. Jesus never did, and he never does. There is coming a crown of life that Christ is going to share with us freely, not because of our own righteousness, but because of our faith and our trust in a God that never failed the test. Amen? Now, but you have tools, right? So far, we've got three of them. Number one, Bible. Number two, watching. When, I, when you hear me talk about Paul saying, Watch, you know, look, walk circumspectly, and I put that in the context of read the whole chapter instead of just one little piece of a verse that somebody gives you to make sure that what they're telling you is dead on with the Scriptures. But also, and I'd say the primary application is actually that we walk through life watching to see where danger might come from. Okay? Everybody look back here. Look, look at Ryan. Hi, Ryan. What are you doing back there, Ryan? He's watching all the security cameras to make sure that nobody tries to come in the building while we're sitting here not paying attention outside having church. 
because that's how the shooters come in. The shooters come in because everybody's sitting out in church and nobody's watching the doorways, nobody's watching the exits, nobody's watching the parking lot, okay? And we just decided here, didn't really have to vote on it, I just think it makes sense that we have somebody watching the cameras, somebody watching the doors back there, somebody listening to make sure what's going on, okay? Um, Friday? When Sweetie Pie, well, I'll, I'll give you this, Thursday night, going to Walmart, I had my sidearm right here, and it was in plain view. I wasn't trying to hide it, okay? I've got this new, it looks like a cell phone cover, and that's what it's supposed to be. But my little 38 fits so neatly down in there, I couldn't pass it up. And it's very comfortable to wear. So Thursday night, Lisa wanted me to take her to Walmart. I took her to Walmart. But while everybody's focused on the merchandise, I'm, I'm watching. I'm looking around. I don't want to be the next guy on the news. Amen? Friday, I walk around with Lisa. And I didn't have my jacket on. I was just carrying this cell phone cover with a pistol in it. And I walked, we went in the mall, we went in all the stores, Costco and Sam's and... All of these places. And I'm walking around with a sidearm. And I'm watching people. I'm just looking around. Because I'm with my wife. And I don't want anybody to hurt my wife. That would kill me if somebody hurt my wife and I didn't do anything about it. Okay? Walk circumspectly. Watch. Be a watchman. Now, I want you to think about this. There's two ways to live. You can live high and holy. Or you can live low down. Which one is going to give you the better vantage point? Living high. I mean, set standards high for yourself. Put it in your mind that there's some things I'm not going to watch on TV anymore. There's some books I'm not going to read anymore. There's some websites I'm not going to go to anymore. There's certain people that I, I may have to work with them, but I'm not hanging around them in the lunchroom. Because they'll talk me into doing something I don't really care about doing anymore, but they'll talk me into it. That's how stupid and weak I am, okay? And you just, you just, all of a sudden now, you take on a mindset of someone who is vigilant rather than someone who just lazily lets the devils come right in, because they will. Now, they're subtle, and I know sometimes they just slip in, and no matter how good you're watching, all of a sudden, there they are. But when you recognize them, do something about it. Amen? Okay? So we have, Bible, we have Bible verses, we have watching, and then we have praying. Pray that you not enter into temptation. What is the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you go and pray anything... Ask God to lead you away from temptation and not toward it. The fact of it is, God has probably already altered the course of your life so many times where He saw danger miles ahead, days ahead, and He just got you over doing something else for a while until that temptation passed. And you never knew anything about it. How many of you believe that one? God has ministering angels watching over us. Now, the things that we do, the things that we fall into, the things that we sin, God allowed it for His glory and His purpose. Because remember, get enough of this stuff, and all of a sudden, you're going to hate it. You're going to start hating it. It's not going to do you a bit of good to try to go back and live that old lifestyle again because you hate it. it just It's not you anymore. First thing my mama did when she finally gave up cigarettes and quit smoking, we were at National Supermarket over here. I'll never forget it. And there was this gal in front of us. This is back when everybody smoked everywhere, including your hospital, ER, your hospital room. How you doing? So anyway, this lady was unloading stuff out of her cart, and she was one of these. She had the cigarette back here. And mom's going, oh, 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 man, oh. And she said, 
I wish these people that smoke wouldn't just wave that in front of everybody. And I'm just going, really, Mom? Really? Now you know how I feel. Okay? Uh, you watch and you pray that God will, not, will lead you away from temptation. However, God is not in the business of isolating us and sequestering us and putting us in this little bubble wrap so that no harm comes to us whatsoever. You have an immune system in your body. Who in here has ever had the mumps? You ever had the mumps? I've had the mumps, and I will never again have the mumps. Why? I've already had them. My body has already fought that off and learned how to fight it off. And I can be around people with mumps all day long, and I might get that little mump infection, but it won't have any effect on me because my body already knows how to deal with that. Now, you think about that. God leads us into certain situations, just like in Judges. He said, I'm going to teach you how to fight. I'm going to teach you how to do battle. I'm going to teach you just how bad and evil some of these devils really are. I read the testimony of a man that uh, he wrote an expose of the New Age movement back in the 80s. And um, he, did, he used a, a pseudonym to write the book because the things that he was exposing in that book he was uncovering some pretty diabolical things back then of what the New Age movement was going to try to do in government and education and churches and every place like that. And his testimony was is that he got saved and came out of that stuff and he wanted to expose it. And some, something's interesting about this man is that not too long after he wrote this book, he disappeared. He's gone. Nobody knows where he is. But... He exposed the New Age movement like this. He got pulled into it because he was taught to encounter these lovely angels. He got in contact with these beautiful, luminous, glorified spirit beings. And the first time he was in their presence, he said, I felt a love and a warmth just gush over me that I have never felt before. And it was so great. So he got hooked into it. So he's learning now methods of spending more time with these spirits. And he said, he never, he'll never forget the first time he was, in, he was in contact with these spirit beings. And all of a sudden, one of them turned on him and just tore him up emotionally. And he pulled back and he went, well, I must have done something wrong. And he said, the further and the deeper I got in with these spirits, the darker and the evil they became. And he said, I got to a point where I was literally scared to death to do my little trance or to go into my little meditation state so I can get in contact with these spirits. He said, I would dread it. And then he said, I would not do it. I decide one day I wasn't going to get in contact with them. And he said, they harassed me and they tortured me emotionally and mentally. Every time I didn't get in with them that day, they tore me to pieces. He said, the more I knew about them, the less I liked them. And he said, then I started hating them because he, would, he discovered just how evil they were. Are. are you with me? First time you sinned a certain sin. It was great. It was pleasing. It felt good. I never did understand, why does it feel good to say certain curse words? You can say, water bucket! And it's not the same. You don't go, well, I feel better after saying water bucket. Okay? You say some of these words and all of a sudden, well, I'm glad I got that out. My point is, everybody in here should know, and if you don't know, then you listen. The farther you get with sin, that's how far you're getting with the spirits that are associated with that sin. And the closer you get to them, the worse it's going to get for you. 
They are evil. And they're very vindictive. And they will try to destroy you for serving them. Okay? So, read your Bible. Watch and pray that God protects you from these evil spirits. Amen? Uh, turn to uh, Luke chapter 8. Laura, did you ever have an experience similar to that where you got harassed by devils? I believe that. Physically assaulted, I believe that. I believe that. Okay? Luke, 8, chap Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Now verse 13, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe. And in time of what? What do they do in time of temptation? Fall away. See that phrase, fall away? Underline that and write Hebrews 6. For it is impossible for once, those who are once enlightened have tasted of the gift, tasted of the heavenly gift, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, okay, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. I absolutely believe that this verse is attached to 2 Thessalonians 2. The falling away. These have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation... There is coming a time, people, a day of temptation. A day of trial. And again, it's not a trial of how good you can be. It's a trial of faith. Do you really believe the Bible? Do you really believe what it says? Because the deception that's coming is going to be so powerful and so overwhelming, no one is going to escape it. The, har the world's most hardened atheist, who does not believe in any kind of spiritual realm whatsoever, will be converted on that day to believe in and follow spirits. Okay? Church members are going to fall for this. Pastors are going to fall for this. Okay? Only the elect will not. That's who you want to be. Amen? I want to be the elect so that I do not fall away with these people. Okay? But anyway, in time of temptation, fall away. And that, then, then we have that which fell among thorns. What are these thorns? They're char the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And they choke out the word of God. So whether it's the stony ground or the thorny, thorny ground, you're dealing with people in church who either because they have no root in themselves, they're just shallow Christians, and they got a lot up top but not very much down below. And they have no foundation, and a time of temptation comes, and it just, boom, it gets them. They're gone. Or... Slowly but surely, the things that they refuse to give over to God in their life, every one of those things is going to choke out the Word of God and it's going to have no effect in their life whatsoever. Either way, you want sin as far away from you as possible. Okay? But then, verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the Word, keep, uh, keep it, and bring forth fruit with what? Patience. How many days does t patience take? Every one of them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians 10. Turn there. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Well, we're on a roll here. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Just makes sense, doesn't it? Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, fell in one day. Three and twenty thousand. In one day, twenty-three thousand people died. Why? Because of what they were doing at the base of Mount Sinai. The fornication, the whoredoms. It was disgusting. It was pure evil down in that camp. Okay? Verse... Um, Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That's uh, the book of Numbers. They murmured, complained against Christ. And uh, God said, fine. And he sent fiery serpents among them that bit them. That poison coming out of their mouth. And here's, here's what will happen in your life. You'll start... You'll start disagreeing with Jesus. You'll start disagreeing with Jesus. And that's going to go on for a while until God's going to say He's going to loose fiery serpents on you, spirits, and you'll be poisoned by what comes out of their mouth. You will fall for false doctrine, false teachings, doctrines of devils. That's poison, just like serpent's poison is. Okay? It's toxic. And it's meant to destroy you. Why? Because you murmured and complained against the word of the Lord. Okay? Um, verse 11. Or verse 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed to the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now, verse 12. Uh, no, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Sterling, do you think that all the trials and temptations that you've had in your life are unique and nobody else has ever had to deal with what you've had to deal with? No. Mike, do you think that way? All of us have been hit pretty much the same way. The devil's tried to destroy us. He's tried to get us so deep in sin that we couldn't get out of it. Or maybe got us so deep in sin that we didn't want to get out of it. And God just could have left us there. Destroyed. Eaten. Okay? But he didn't. The temptation that has come to you, same temptation that happened to Eve, same temptation that happened to Christ. Three times in the wilderness, three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. That temptation of walking out of that garden alive was very real to him. Three times he said it. Peter and the other, other guys, they fell out. They, you, I think Jesus finally got tired of waking them up. Okay? Now, here's, here's what I get out of this. I was reading that last night and it just really blessed my heart, Courtney. Because here's Jesus. He keeps coming back to his disciples and they're all asleep. Do you know he does not take a whip out and start whipping and thrashing them and say, How dare you? You're supposed to be my disciples, did you? He didn't do that. You know why? He himself was struggling in that garden. And he understood how hard it was for his disciples. He's not mad at them. He's not seeking vengeance for them. He is, in about 12 hours, going to die for them. Give them victory. That's love, amen? So, there's no temptation taking you but such is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, everybody has their spin on this verse. Some people say, well, you know, God won't put anything on you that you can't handle. And I hear that a lot. I'm not sure that I agree with that reading of it. When it says, he will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, make, uh, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. I think every temptation on you is more than you can handle. Because of your weakness. Because your flesh. And so I don't think Paul is saying here, 
Well, if you fell, it's your own fault. You, should, you could have withstood it, but God won't put anything on you that you can't handle. I don't think it reads that way. I think it reads that even when these bad, big temptations come on you, you have a way to escape. Escape is not enduring. Escape is escape. Joseph. Joseph had a woman with her arms around him enticing him. Joseph did not stand there and say, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. I can withstand you, I can do this. That's not what he did. He fled so fast that she had his coat. Of course, she went against him, didn't he? Look, he raped me. <laughs> Evil woman. Joseph escaped. So should you have. You should have got out of there. You should have left. You shouldn't have stayed on Facebook that long. Oh, the earth is flat. I need to leave. Sorry. Because I'm fixing to get into it. I got to get out of here. Amen? Amen. Um, Galatians 6, we read that. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Here's another type of temptation. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Amen? If God wanted you to take stuff out of this world, He would have built you with pockets. Like a kangaroo. We can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So I'm, I'm bringing, I brought this up last night. We were eating supper. Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon.com, $100 billion, John, this guy has. He can have it. Because he doesn't want $100 billion. He wants $200 billion. He wants three hundred. He wants, these guys always want more. And it's like they're so disappointed. Oh my goodness, I lost $4.5 billion in the stock market yesterday. Yeah, but you still got that other, you know, $98 billion hanging in the bank. So why are you complaining? I don't get it. And of course, I asked the question last night. I wonder if Jeff Bezos buys stuff from Amazon.com. I, I don't know. Maybe he does. I don't know. But anyway, look at verse um, 8. Having food and raiment, that let us therewith be content. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now, the, the only thing, well, there was a couple things that really gave me pause about voting for Donald Trump was he was a billionaire. And he thinks the way a billionaire thinks. And he thinks that the best way to revive this country is to make it wealthy. And I don't agree with that. Now, some of the things he says, some of the things he stands for, I'm all, I'm all in favor of that. And I quit thinking years ago that we were ever going to get a King James-only Bible-believing fundamentalist to be President of the United States. I don't think it's going to happen, okay? The guy we got is the guy we got. And I want him to do certain things for our country. But just securing more government contracts or just allowing businesses to grow and thrive and prosper in this nation, just rolling back some of these regulations that Obama put in place, trying to cut Obamacare, which, I mean, I'm in favor of all these. That's not really what our country, our country needs a godly leader who will lead this country in prayer, fasting, righteousness, and not care what anybody else says or thinks about him, but lead this nation in righteousness. The bottom line is, rich people will always fall into a temptation and a snare. Do you know why? They will either try to make more money or protect the money they have, and almost always they're going to have to break a law or a regulation or something like that in order to do it. Businessmen, I'm in favor of businessmen. I'm in favor of small businesses and so on, but I've seen it too many times when businessmen... Even Christian ones get caught up in things they should not get caught up with. Why? They're trying to protect the riches. Trying to protect the wealth. 
they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the... This Bible's right. It's the only one that says it. The love of money is the root of all evil. Think Mystery Babylon. She is the great, the mother of who? Harlots. Why do harlots do what harlots do? Love of money. It's that simple. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many... They, what will money and the love of money cause you to do? Err from the what? What does it say there? Faith. That's the very thing that's on trial. Would you sell your soul for a hundred billion dollars? Would you sell your children out for financial gain? Nope. It's not worth it. And I'm not selling my vineyard. I'm not selling away the faith that God has given me. I'm not selling you church people out. I got offered a job a few years ago. I got offered a pretty good paying job, high profile, and I said no, because my place was here, okay? Now, I don't tell you that, so I can try to get a raise out of you. I don't care, okay? I'm just saying money should not ever dictate the righteous choices that we make as Christians and as a church. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Uh, we went through Hebrews. Um, let's go to, let's see here, where do I want to go? Yeah, turn to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and we're going to be done here. 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You see, while I turn down the riches of this world, I know that I am gaining the riches of heaven. What does the Bible say about money and wings trust not in uncertain riches for it grows wings as a bird and flies away and if you look on the back of a one dollar bill it has wings on it okay i'm just going how did god know that okay it'll fly it'll fly away just like that it'll be gone the uncertain riches of this world but in heaven those riches are eternal. I can spend it all and still not spend it all. Amen? I walk on streets of gold for crying out loud. I live in a house that's surrounded by gates of pearl. Ha! Ah, amen. So, um, verse 6, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Manifold means there's many of them. And they're just piling on one after another. You ever felt that way sometimes? You have these times where something goes wrong and you get through it, but then you have these times where this goes wrong and then this goes wrong and then this goes wrong right on top of it and then this happens and you're just going, God, when is this going to stop? God knows about it, does he not? So look at your Bible. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, remember, it's not a trial of your righteousness. Your righteousness is not your right. It came to you from Christ. There's no need to try Christ's righteousness. It's already been tried. But your faith, even when you're going through the hardest things in life, will you still believe the Word of God? Trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, who having... Not seeing, you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. You've given it this long. Why stop now? Amen? 
Sterling, how long have you been saved? Lost count, 1960 something or another, right? About as long as I've been alive. Okay? You plan on converting to Buddhism anytime soon? No. No, I don't think so. Number one, he couldn't spell it. Number two, he's just given all of his life for the cause of Jesus Christ. The days that are ahead of him are less than the days that are behind him. Why would he trade in now what he's got when he's one day closer to that eternal prize? At some point, you're going to reach the point of no return. You're going to get to a place in your walk with Jesus where it's too far to go back, which is a good thing. So you just might as well keep walking forward and keep walking to heaven. Amen? That's the end of your salvation. That's where it ends, right there. No more faith, no more salvation, no more Bible. Now we have it for real, and we're going to have it for all of eternity. Amen? Every temptation that you pass, it's just one more day, you're closer to heaven. Every temptation that you fail, is just one more thing that Christ atones for, and you're one day closer to heaven. I can't wait some days, amen? I'd really rather go some days than not. But while God's got us down here, let's walk this road. Let's avoid temptation. Watch for it. Pray against it. Give it your Bible. Feed your temptations Bible verses. See how long they last. Stand to your feet. Did you learn something today? I hope so. Uh, let me read this before we pray. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. God knows how to lead us out of the wilderness, doesn't he? God knows how to build an ark. He knows how to walk through the water. Who knows how to walk through the water and on the water? I'd say we got the water pretty much covered. Amen. Either way, God's going to lead you out of it. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this Bible. Thank you, Lord. It is our, it is our road map. It is our guidebook. It is our help manual showing us, God, how you will help us along. God, it is what keeps us from sin. But even, Father, if we get into sin, this word, Father, will cause us to cry out for help and God deliver us once again. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you, dear God, that contained in this book is everything that I need to avoid the temptations that come in my life. It's everything I need. So, Father, help me to watch. Help me to pray more. Help me, Lord, to open my mind and my heart and my study time to the Word of God. Teach me some great and mighty things, Lord, that I don't know. And prepare me, Father, for days that are coming because I don't know just how bad this world's going to get, but I think it's going to get pretty bad. And God, during that time, I know for a fact that I'll need to be anchored to your word. Because if not, I'll float away for sure. Father, thank you, Lord, for the great and precious promises that you give us. Father, there may be someone tonight listening to me, someone here, that right now, they're in an hour of temptation. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would deliver them from it. Or that you'll walk through it with them. Never letting go of their hand. Never causing them to perish. But leading them all the way. Thank you, Father, for being so faithful to us. Help us to be faithful to you and to your Son. And it's through Jesus we pray. And all of God's people said.